OK, so I mean, it's good to know your Taylor series and uh, you know, set in carefully and so on. But most of the time, you don't get that much into the weeds of Taylor series, which like most of the time, you don't need things as fancy as this integral trick. And uh, let me just tell you perhaps the highest level takeaway from this lawn Taylor series bit, which is this. The thing to remember is that you know, lawn of 1 plus x is basically x when x is small. OK, so when you write the paper, you, know, you actually have to worry about the exact error bounds and cite Taylor series and so forth. But when you're just trying to figure out for yourself like, what the answer is, you should just be like, oh, ln 1 plus x? That's like basically x. And then you can just have a mental picture of how to continue with your calculation. Um, by the way, you know, we have many symbols now. And like this, this one uh, swung dash has an official meaning like this. This two swung dash is approximately equal. This has no meaning. It's like a vague symbol that just intuitively means it's kind of roughly equal to. So that's what I mean by that. Uh, this is a good fact to know, but there's an even better fact to know, which is what you get if you do e to the both sides of this, if you exponentiate both sides of this. If you exponentiate both sides of this, then on the left-hand side, you get e to the x. And on the right-hand side, you get rid of the ln, and you get e to the x is approximately 1 plus x for small x. <clears throat> and this one I want to put in a box, because this is like the greatest facts of all to remember. Like if you remember one fact about, I don't know, Taylor series and approximation and so forth, it's this. e to the x is really close to 1 plus x. Or conversely, 1 plus x is really close to e to the x. You might want to use it that way, too. Um, yeah, this, I mean, use this as much as possible in your life, uh, and you'll be happy. Uh, so, I mean, OK, a few, bit, few more words about this, why it's true and what it means, given that I just told you this is a meaningless symbol. Uh, so what is e to the x? Well, a different way in a calculus textbook that they define e to the x, as opposed to the inverse function of log and so forth, is by this formula. e to the x is uh, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus <coughs> x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial plus dot, 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 dot. So even this is you know, 2 factorial, and this is over 1 factorial, and over 0 factorial. <coughs> but this is, the, in some sense, the definition. And this holds for all, I mean, x, but we're going to think about the case where x is small. And again, when x is a small number, x is small. And like x squared is even smaller. x squared over 2 is even smaller. is even smaller, even smaller, and so forth. OK, so that sort of justifies this. In particular, it justifies, or with a little bit of thought, you can justify that this is 1 plus x plus order x squared. Uh, let me put in plus or minus, just in case. But yeah, plus. Um, this is as x is going to 0. In fact, uh, you may like to use the fact that this error term here is in the interval, strictly in the interval between 0 and x squared uh, for all x between 0 and 1, or minus 1 and 1. OK, but these are some more accurate facts than this key intuitive fact. So uh, I will show you, actually, towards the end of this lecture, like an illustration of using this approximation to great effect. But we'll do a few other things first. Uh, actually, since we're on the subject of Taylor series, let me give you some more important Taylor series facts that will come up for you. So quite often, you might see this one, 1 minus Sorry, 1 over 1 minus epsilon, <coughs> where epsilon is, again, a small number. So of course, it's a little bit bigger than 1, because 1 minus epsilon is a little bit smaller than 1. OK, and this is 1 plus epsilon. Well, really, you know, plus epsilon squared, plus epsilon cubed, plus epsilon to the fourth, et cetera, at least when epsilon is smaller than 1. But you know, the thing to remember is that this is 1 plus epsilon plus epsilon squared. OK, so 1, 1 over 1 minus epsilon. 
basically the same thing as 1 plus epsilon. In fact, you can kind of derive it from this. You see how? I mean, you can say, and uh, this is not 100% precise, but you know, it's an example of like, well, let's just get to the right answer. And then when we know what the right answer is, we'll figure out how to write it very carefully. I mean, 1 over 1 minus epsilon. I just told you that 1 minus, OK, 1 plus x is basically the same thing as e to the x. So take x to be minus x. So 1 minus x is basically the same thing as e to the minus x. All right, so this is basically 1 over e to the minus epsilon. OK, which now we can, this is a true fact of mathematics. This is e to the epsilon. I mean, it's a reciprocal. And then this is 1 plus epsilon. <laughs> This is not a joke. It's totally, I mean, you can justify this, but um, this is not how you would actually, I, I never actually think this. It's just something like I noticed when I was preparing the lecture. And I was like, oh, that's cute. It illustrates that this fact is so useful. Um, because I don't know, I, it's, I don't know, I have this one in my head. So going from this to this is straightforward, but you can, you can do it. Um, another one is at root 1 plus epsilon. Uh, I don't ever remember the exact Taylor series for this, but I know it starts 1 plus a half epsilon, and then the next thing is epsilon squared. So this is another good thing to remember. Square root of 1 plus epsilon, very similar to 1 plus epsilon. It's 1 plus theta of epsilon, and the exact constant is a half. Of course, you can also get this one using the same idea, right? <laughs> right? Because this is approximately e to the epsilon square root. So e to the epsilon is like 1 plus epsilon. Now by the true laws of exponents, this is e to the epsilon over 2. And by this approximate law, this is approximately 1 plus epsilon over 2, which, as promised. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's no joke. This is, really, uh, this is really useful. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. We're doing OK. Let's do. Um, Practice example. I mean, this is like instead of lecture time, it's like tutorial time. I'll just give you a quick illustration of how to do a problem. So, how about this? What are the asymptotics of square root of n plus 1 minus square root of n? This is the sort of thing that comes up. And yeah, it's true. Square root of n plus 1 is very close to square root of n. So this is basically 0. But OK, now we're asking how close to 0 is it? And how would I try to solve this problem? Well, I guess you try to put things into standard form as much as possible. So uh, square root of n is already doing great. So, I mean, it doesn't get, you can't really simplify this anymore. But this is not so great. I mean, it's not in the standard form that we talked about before. But we have this belief that it's very close to square root n. So we should strive to make it look like square root n as much as we can. So the way I would do that is like the following. Uh, square root n plus 1 is a little bit like the thing we did with ln of n plus 1. Uh, this is square root of n times 1 plus 1 over n. I guess this is the main trick. And I did this because now, I mean, by property of square roots, root AB is root A times root B. This is square root n times square root 1 plus 1 over n. OK, and now things are looking pretty good because we can use this fact here with epsilon being 1 over n. OK, so this is equal to, let's say, root n times 1 plus 1 over 2n plus or minus order 1 over n squared. Okay, So it's basically 1. This is basically, you know, 1 plus a little bit is 1 plus that thing over 2. So this is basically 1 plus 1 over 2n. Just for you, I even put in like the, you know, the big O of the next term, which is 1 over n squared. OK, and now we can multiply this out because we're preparing to subtract root n. So this is root n plus 1 over 2 root n plus or minus order 1 over n to the 1.5. OK, 
OK, and then we're subtracting n. Let's write f of n for this. So therefore, f of n, the root n's cancel, and we get the next term, which is what we're going for. 1 over 2 root n, plus or minus order 1 over n to the 1.5. OK, and this is asymptotically smaller than this. If you want, you can factor it. So we get 1 over 2 root n, 1 plus or minus order 1 over n. OK, and now we finally got it down into like, this is sort of standard form, 1 over 2 root n. And this thing is tending to 1. And pretty fast, too, at the rate of uh, the error being like 1 over n. OK, so we finally conclude that this is asymptotic to 1 over 2 root n. Any questions? OK. Uh, I'm going to skip the other. I did one more example for like practice, but I'm going to skip it for time. But I'll have notes up. And you can see how I would analyze some other expression like log of 1 over 1 minus 2 epsilon or something. OK. Uh, I now want to tell you another couple of asymptotic tricks that it's good to get good at. And the first one is concerned with inverting functions. Basically, trying to come up with the inverse function of a given function. It's very rare that you can do this exactly, but asymptotically, it's usually quite doable. So I'll give like one of the simplest examples. Let's say we have this relationship that y is x ln x. OK, and let's assume that x is, think of x as large, certainly at least 1, maybe going to infinity. So here, like y is a function of x. OK, x ln x kind of looks like, uh, what does it look like? That's not convex. Something like this, y. OK, so y is a function of x. But you might also ask, you know, for a given large value of y, like this one, I really care about this one, what is the x value that achieves that y? OK, so we want to come up with x as a function of y. And we want to know, you know, what is this asymptotic to? So there's like, uh, this is some well-defined function, because x ln x is increasing. It does not have a standard mathematical name. But that's OK. We don't quit. We can still find out what its asymptotics are. Mm, so how do we do this? Well, uh, kind of do it like a little bit heuristically at first, and then you can make things a bit more proper as you go along. So one thing you can observe is uh, y is basically x. It's theta tilde of x, right? It's like saying if you ignore log factors, which are small factors, it's basically like y is proportional to x. OK? And why do I bring that up? Well, first of all, it guides us to what the final answer will probably be. I mean, x should be, x as a function of y should also be kind of linear. I mean, x should be roughly, you can see from the picture I've drawn, x should be roughly kind of like y. Um, but the reason it's particularly useful is that um, if you take log of both sides, ln y should be, and I'll use this you know, fake symbol, should be approximately ln x. And this is like even more true than this was in the sense that you know, ln really compresses things. So if these are like vaguely close, and these are going to be like quite close. And let me make that a bit more proper. Um, if we just take this defining relationship and take the log of both sides there, okay, we get that ln y equals ln x plus ln ln x. Okay? And this is asymptotic to ln x. Because okay, this is growing asymptotically less quickly than ln x. This is as x goes to infinity, and that simultaneously means that y is also going to infinity. 
And now we're in great shape because it means that x ln x is asymptotic to x ln y. And box tells, uh, tells us that this is y. So we have that, um, oh, I should have written it this way. x ln y is asymptotic to x ln x, which equals y by the box relationship. And uh, that's good, right? Because like now we can solve for x in this relationship. Okay, we can just divide both sides by uh, ln y. And we can finally conclude that x is asymptotic to y over ln y. OK, it kind of makes sense. It's kind of reasonable, right? I mean, this is like saying y is basically like x, but big, bigger by like a logarithmic factor. And so therefore, you would feel that like x is kind of like y, except smaller by a logarithmic factor. And the only thing to note is that you know, that's correct. These are both the same. I mean, it's the logarithmic factor in y here and in x here, but that's the same thing because y and x are about the same. So when I see an expression like this, I say, I, I mean, these are the words I say in my head uh, before I write it down correctly. I'm like, well, this basically means that y is pretty much the same as x. And so this log and x is pretty much the same as log y. And that's good because now I can solve for x. OK, so let me do one more example of this. I hesitate to erase this great fact, but I guess I got to. So let's say I think to myself, all right, for some reason I have t squared log t equals n cubed, solve for t. Right, and it's like a little bit annoying if this log t weren't here, you'd be like, no problem, I square root both sides and I'm done. But I have this log t here, which is a drag. Um, but how do I solve this? Well, let's start out by taking the square root. That's going to help us. It's going to get us to t times root log t equals n to the 3 halves. And now again, in my head, I always say that like, uh, okay, like, this is, ba this is very close to t. So t is like basically on the order of n to the 3 halves. In particular, log t is really going to be like log n up to a constant factor. And that's good because now I can replace this log t with log n and bring it to the other side. Okay, so I mean to say it somewhat more formally, therefore log t, if I take the log of both sides, I get log t plus a half log log t equals 3 halves log n. And let me not even go down to the level of constants here. Let me just be satisfied with big theta. So this implies that log t is big theta of log n. Do the same up to a constant factor, that constant factor being roughly 1.5. OK, now I can plug this in back here and conclude that t times uh, theta of square root log n equals n to the 3 halves, and therefore t is theta of n to the 3 halves over root log n. OK? Uh, great. So now let me actually give you an example of like, well, a contrived example, but a an example of where this kind of thing comes up in TCS. Um, this is concerned, like a common thing that comes up, like minimizing or maximizing an expression with a parameter. So maybe you're trying to design like a fast algorithm for some problem on input size n. And you know, your algorithm might have a choice, a parameter choice. Let's call that parameter of choice t. And maybe you can choose t to be whatever you want, and it affects the running time in a somewhat complicated way. And now you're trying to figure out what is the best t to choose to make my running time as fast as possible. Okay, so let's say, this is hypothetically, your algorithm's running time on an input of size n is, I just made this up, order n cubed over t plus 
order t log t. This is the sort of thing that like happens. I don't know, you like one piece of your algorithm takes t log t time if you chose t to be something, and uh, another part goes faster if you choose t bigger. I don't know, maybe you're bucketing some things into t buckets, and so this is how many buckets you have, and there's some extra processing per bucket. And you can see like it's not exactly clear how to choose the best t, right? I mean, if you make t bigger, that makes this part go down, but it makes this part go up, okay, and conversely. So, you know, for any t you wish, so what t should you wish? Well, uh, the heuristic, and this is like a little, you know, life tip I want to impart here. The heuristic, when you have this expression, like you have like a sum of two expressions, you should choose, and you have a parameter to play with, and you're trying to minimize them, you should choose a parameter to make these expressions the same. Okay? This is not a proof of anything, but like this is the heuristic that works. And why does it kind of work? Um, well, let me just draw a little picture on the side. One thing is that uh, this is another little life heuristic. A plus B is basically the same as maximum of A and B. And so uh, sometimes it can be good to pass and for back and forth between these two things. So this is another like good fact to remember. Uh, why do I say this? And by the way, I'm assuming things are non-negative here. Well, a plus b is certainly at least the max, but also it's at most two times the max, because, well, you just increase whichever one of these is not the max up to the max, and you get two times the max. So, if you don't care about constant factors, and clearly in this example, like we have big O's, we don't care about constant factors, um, these two sums are, the sum is basically the same as the max. And so your problem is equivalent to like, how do I find to choose t so that these are both simultaneously small? And if you kind of think of this one as like a of t, and this one as like b of t, think of n as fixed, um, a of t is getting smaller as t gets bigger, and b of t is getting larger as t gets bigger. Um, and like the max here is like this. So that's kind of my justification for this heuristic, that you should try to choose the t that makes where they cross, where the two quantities are about the same. And another good thing here is that, like, you don't, in this situation, you don't have to, like, rigorously prove much of anything, because at the end of the day, you're just going to say, like, I choose t to be this, and therefore my running time is that. And of course, you want to choose the best t you can, but you don't have to justify that you chose the best t because you don't have to. You can just be like, this is the t I chose. And of course, the reader probably believes that you did it effectively. But anyway, so for this heuristic, if we set this up, n cubed over t to be equal to t log t, and you can see I ignored the constants already. Well, this is n cubed equals t squared log t. Yeah, I did it, yeah. So this is the same as my example. Uh, and therefore, you know, t is theta of n to the three halves over root log n. And you could see that, like, I was not careful with the constants. So, like, in your in your paper, you could just say, having done this analysis, I choose t to be, let's say, exactly this. Forget the theta, or you know, this rounded off to the nearest integer. And that'll be the most effective t. And you can see that this final thing, what will it turn out to be? Both terms should turn out to be the same thing, unless we've made an error. So this is n cubed over n to the 3 halves over root log n. So this is order n to the 3 halves root log n. And this is order, OK, so the log of this is just log n to the power of 1. So that brings the root log n up to the top n to the 3 halves root log n. OK, and indeed, these are the same thing. So the final answer, your final running time is this. This is an example, by the way, of like how a strange kind of running time, for example, like n to the 3 halves root log n could arise. I mean, this is not too unusual. This is not too unusual. And then it arises due to this kind of minimization process. <laughs>